Hey, welcome back, everyone. This is Kevin Wallace again. During this month, and uh, I'm recording this at the end of September 2010, during this month, we've been focusing on various sea voice topics. And this is all part of the one exam a month strategy for my blog with Network World. The idea is we want to focus on certification relevant topics for one exam every month. And based on the C voice videos that we've had this month, let's take a look at some practice questions. And I've already posted a few of these practice questions on my blog, so some of you may have already gone through those questions and are here to see what the correct answers are. And I've included a couple of bonus questions as well. Let's get started with the first one. And that is, you wish to connect an analog phone to a voice-enabled router. To which type of voice interface would you connect an analog phone? Would that be a T1, an E1, an E&M, an FXO, or an FXS port? In our video entitled, uh, The Secret Life of an Analog Voice Board, we talked about three different types of analog voice ports, E&M, FXO, FXS. T1 and E1, those are digital voice ports. We talked about those in the Let's Get Digital videos. So we know it's E&M, FXO, or FXS. And we said that E&M stood for ear and mouth, earth and magneto, the E and receive, or the M and transmit. Different literature says different things. But E&M is typically used to interconnect a PBXs for something like a tie line. So that's not where we would typically connect an analog phone. What about FXO? That stands for Foreign Exchange Office. And we said the easy way to remember that was a Foreign Exchange Office connects to an office, like a central office going back to the phone company, in other words. In your home, you might have a voice-enabled router, and you could plug an FXO port into the wall jack going back to the telephone company. And that FXO port, it could receive calls, it could place calls, but it's not something that we would normally hook an analog phone to. FXS, Foreign Exchange Station, we said the easy way to remember that was the Foreign Exchange Station connects to a station. And that is the correct answer for this question. We would connect an analog phone to an FXS port on a voice-enabled router. Let's take a look at our second question. In this question, we're told you need an E&M connection in an environment with significant electromagnetic interference, or EMI. Which E&M type prevents EMI from being interpreted as signaling? Maybe on a big factory floor we've got motors and generators kicking on, or maybe we have a high-powered antenna nearby. We don't want electromagnetic interference to be interpreted as signaling. And the E&M type that can help prevent that is E&M type 3. E&M type 3 is what we're looking for here. Some of the characteristics of the other E&M types we wanted you to know about. Type 1, most common in North America. Type 5, most common outside of North America. But both of these types required a common ground. The router, if you're using a router, needs to be on the same electrical system as the PBX. Type 2, however, allowed us to have different grounds. We might have one device in one building on one power system and another device in another building on another power system. That would be okay with type 2. And type 4, we said, wasn't really supported in the Cisco world. That's not a configuration option. And of course, type 3, we just mentioned, although it's not very popular, you don't see it that much, it can help prevent electromagnetic interference from being interpreted as signaling. Let's check out our next question. Here we're being asked, when a call comes into your voice-enabled router, the router answers. In other words, the router gives a dial tone. It doesn't say, hello, we hear a dial tone calling into that router. And the caller hears a dial tone coming from the router. What dial peer configuration mode command would prevent the sending of this secondary dial tone? By the way, when this happens, if you call into a router and you're presented with a dial tone, it doesn't mean that your call is not going to go through. It's simply two-stage dialing. You dialed once to call into the router, and now the router is prompting you with a dial tone and allowing you to dial a second time. You could then dial perhaps an internal extension. That's two-stage dialing. Probably not what we want in most corporate networks. How do we prevent that from happening? Well, we go into dial peer configuration mode for the inbound dial peer, and while we might be using the incoming called hyphen number dot command to match the DNS, the dialed number information service, in other words, the dial string coming into the router, that's used to match the number, but the command that prevents the secondary dial tone is direct hyphen inward hyphen dial. Again, that's going to be given in dial peer configuration mode for the inbound dial peer. Let's take a look at the next question. 
Which command provisions 3B channels and 1D channel for a T1 PRI? By the way, this might be a fairly common configuration in a home lab environment. I know when I built my voice CCIE study rack, I didn't buy enough DSPs to accommodate full T1 circuits everywhere. So what I did, I would use maybe the first three channels on a digital circuit. Which command is going to do this for us? Well, first, notice that the question is specifying a T1 PRI, primary rate interface. In other words, we're using common channel signaling. We're not using CAS. We're not using channel associated signaling. If we were using channel associated signaling, we would start to provision those channels with the DS0 hyphen group command. But that's not what we're doing. We're using a CCS, common channel signaling, for ISDN. So we know it starts with PRI hyphen group. But where does the numbering start? The numbering can be tricky because when you go in to configure the D channel, and let's say that our T1 controller is controller 0 slash 1 slash 0, if you wanted to go into the D channel for that controller, you would go into interface serial 0 slash 1 slash 0 colon 23 because the channels in that case begin their numbering at 0. So for the serial interface, the colon 23, that really is the 24th channel. However, when we're specifying time slots inside of a PRI group, the numbering starts at 1. It's important to keep that straight. That means the proper command would be PRI hyphen group 1 time slots, and instead of 0 through 2, it would be 1 through 3. 1 dash 3, and then a comma 24, because we have to include in that PRI group the D channel for the Q.931 signaling. Those were the questions that I posted on my Network World blog, but I promised a couple of additional bonus questions. Let's take a look at the first one. A dial string of 555-2020 is matched by the following translation rule. In other words, we've gone into translation rule configuration mode, and we can give up to 15 sub rules there. Here we just have one. We're saying rule one, and we see the forward slash and a caret. A 555, a backslash, a parentheses, four dots, a backslash, a parentheses, and a forward slash. And when we see that first set of forward slashes, if you remember from our discussion on voice translation rules in the video entitled Show Me the Digits, whatever's between the first set of forward slashes, that's the pattern that we're trying to match. That's the matching pattern. What's ever between the second set of forward slashes, that's the replacement pattern. And if we've dialed 555-2020, let's first ask, does this even match? The caret means that we're looking for something that begins with 555. And the wild cards, the dots, the periods, they represent a single dial digit. In other words, we're looking for a string that begins with 555 and then at least four other digits. And that matches our 555-2020. But what's up with the parentheses and the backslashes that are kind of encapsulating the four dots? Well, what we're doing here is defining a set. If we put part of that matching string inside of parentheses, that's a set that we can later reference. We could reference that set in the replacement string by saying something like backslash 1 for the first set, backslash 2 for the second set, and so on. And whatever numbers are in that set, well, those numbers are going to be plugged in to the replacement string. And the reason that we have a backslash in front of the parentheses is so that those parentheses will not be interpreted as special characters. They're just parentheses. The replacement string is 1408 backslash 0. If we were specifying the contents of set 1, we would say backslash 1. If we were specifying the contents of set 2, we would say backslash 2. But what's up with backslash 0? Backslash 0 is a way of saying the entire matching string. So in this case, we're matching 555-2020. The replacement string is 1408. And the backslash 0 says, take whatever the matched string was, 555-2020, and put it here. So when we put it all together, we see that we've added a 1 and an area code to our dial string. We now have 1, 4, 0, 8, and then what the matching string was, 5, 5, 5, 20, 20. Did we need the parentheses to pull this off? No, that was a distractor. That was not necessary, but it certainly didn't hurt anything. So our answer is the replacement string would be 1, 4, 0, 8, 5, 5, 5, 20, 20. I've got one more for you. 
And this deals with a voice over IP dial peer. We're saying that we've got a dial peer that matches the dialed number or the DNS string of 555-2020. Which digits are going to be forwarded? And this is by default by the dial peer. We're going into dial peer configuration mode for our voice over IP dial peer and we're saying destination hyphen pattern 555 dot 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 and we're specifying a session target of an IPv4 address of 10.1.1.1. What digits are going to be forwarded by this dial peer over to 10.1.1.1 in this case? You might want to pause the video right now and think about that for a second and formulate your answer. All right, let's discuss how this is going to work. Remember we talked about for a POTS dial peer, by default a POTS dial peer is only going to forward digits that matched wildcard digits. So if this were a POTS dial peer, it's not, but if this were a POTS dial peer and we had a destination pattern of 555 dot 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 and we dialed 555 2020, only the 2020 would be forwarded out of that POTS port. We strip off explicitly matched digits, which would have been 555. However, what you need to notice in this example is it's not a POTS dial peer. It's a voice over IP dial peer, which doesn't have that digit stripping behavior. And as a result, we don't strip anything. With a voice over IP dial peer, all the digits are going to be forwarded on to the session target. So the answer is we're going to be forwarding digits 555-2020. Guys, I certainly hope you've enjoyed our discussions this month on C voice topics. It's been a blast for me. I've been teaching C voice since it was in version, I think it was like 2.1 back around the year 2001. And I've seen it through many different versions. And I've written more than one C voice study guide for Cisco Press. So it's a topic really near and dear to my heart. And I've tried to share some insight with you that can help you in your certification pursuits. And obviously, with a series of videos, we're not able to teach the entire course. But I wanted to give you some tips. But for your further study, you might want to check out my most recent version of the C Voice Authorized Self Study Guide from Cisco Press. This is obviously going to cover a lot more of the topics that you're going to be faced with on the exam. But based on the feedback I've been getting during the month, I think a lot of people are inspired to go after C Voice and they're excited about the new things they're learning. They've discovered some new things that they didn't know before, and that makes it really rewarding for me. Well, stay tuned to my blog site because soon we're going to be announcing uh, our topic for next month. Remember, we're covering one exam a month. And by the way, if you want to visit my website, it's oneexamamonth.com. That's going to have video archives for all of our monthly videos that we're putting out. It's been fun covering Sea Voice topics with you here in September 2010. I wish you the best in your real-world pursuits as well as on the certification exam. And stay tuned to my blog at nww.com. That's networkworld.com, nww.com, slash community, slash Wallace. We'll see you soon.